My guest is Alan St. Pierre from Normal.org. Alan, are you there? I am. Good evening. Good evening, and um, welcome to our show. Uh, Alan, what does Normal stand for, please, for some of our, our viewers or listeners uh, who don't know? On the IRS tax form since 1970, the acronym NORMAL stands for the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Okay, excellent. And ladies and gentlemen, how this show works is um, you can dial in live if you want to on the phone number there, 212-757-1541, and uh, talk on the air. And uh, we do the first segment. We're going to interview Alan about the new marijuana laws in New York City, which are going to impact us all which is very interesting, and then we'll have totally open phones after the weather, and then at the end of the show we play uh, the number one uh, radio song, the video of it, so you don't want to miss that, because that's quite exciting. So 27 minutes, and we're all here together. So, Alan, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, this is what happened this week, and you were on the show, I think maybe four or five months ago, we were talking about New Jersey, because they had uh, made a step towards uh, more legalization, I think, in terms of medical use. And New York Governor Andrew Cuomo asked lawmakers on Monday to decriminalize the possession of small quantities of cannabis, according to the New York Times, in a bid to save young men who are part of minorities who find themselves charged with a crime after being stopped and frisked. And, um, you know, we did a couple shows about stop and frisk, and it always kind of came back to that, little bags of marijuana. In fact, I think that was the impetus for the um, Trayvon Martin, not Trayvon Martin, for a Romarley Graham case in, in, in up in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to ask you exactly, you know, thank you for joining us. And what exactly changed this week? Uh, I, and I saw Mayor Bloomberg came out for it, too, sort of after, the, the, after Cuomo had announced it. So could you give us well, some I, background? Yeah, I think there's probably threefold reason why this has come about. I and mean, you've already touched upon some of them. Number one is that these arrest numbers are staggering for the five boroughs. Um, Traditionally in New York, from 1974 through 1992, the traditional number of people arrested in all of New York for possession of marijuana was around 2,000 people per year. When Mr. Giuliani came in as mayor, he said, a former prosecutor, I'm going after petty crimes and marijuana is going to be one of them. And he jacked the arrest rate up to 58,000 people by the time he left office in 2000. Um, we had some fun with Mayor Bloomberg when he first came into office, assuming wrongly that he was going to bring those numbers down substantially, maybe even to the natural support level of, say, a couple thousand, considering he had been a marijuana user earlier in his life and didn't seem to have much qualms with, with marijuana use per se. So um, here we are all these years later, uh, 10 plus years into his mayorship, and <clears throat> those arrest rates are still above 50,000 people a year are arrested in New York, making that piece of geography the hotbed for marijuana arrests in the United States. Number two is that over the last four or five years, it's been clear, and the New York Times editorial board has really been, and columnists have been really putting the pressure on the mayor and Chief Kelly, that the racial disparity is shocking. It's basically a nine to one ratio of minorities who have been arrested, and I think the final blow to this in the last year or so has been what many of us have known for decade or so, but um, the editorial board beat reporters have finally drawn this out. This, and as you've just mentioned it, the, the stop and frisk, the idea of interfacing with people pretty clearly, young minority males mainly, and to not catch them using marijuana outdoors or in public or in their car, no to ask them to empty their pockets or to empty the uh, purse or their backpack, and then if there was marijuana in there, to then charge them with the crime as if they were publicly using it, and then to bring them into the uh, police station for two or three hours and ultimately only give them a $100 fine because in 1978, the legislature passed a law that at least it used to affect everybody from the end of Long Island all the way to the top of New York State, marijuana was actually decriminalized until Mr. Giuliani and then um, Mr. Bloomberg started this incredible, unbelievable run of costing the taxpayers uh, about $75 million a year to arrest these 50,000 people. So uh, I think those three things coming together and the fact that last year Bloomberg uh, asked um, Kelly to review these policies and to reduce these arrests, 
and the latest review indicates the numbers went up. So with that, Mr. Cuomo, a former attorney general, uh, simply wanted to, I think, knock heads together, get Mr. Bloomberg and Kelly in the same room, which he did for a press conference, and to get them all on board to pass a law that acknowledges that the 1978 law should acknowledge that the private personal possession and use of marijuana is not going to trigger police attention. If you're dumb enough to smoke it walking down the street or sitting at a park bench or sitting in your car, yeah, you're still going to face the same penalties. But what's going to stop this absurd charade and legal sophistry of effectively tricking young minority men into producing marijuana that was in their pocket and then getting arrested for it. So, so how does that trick actually work? Do they ask you to empty your pocket or they reach into your pocket and take it out and then once either way it's exposed you're under arrest exactly and so what happens oh, is, is, is that the case is, is it either is it either way it could happen either way but it more often than not happen with the police walking up to a group of people who they thought was sort of loitering hanging around in front of a club maybe as you well know now that smoking isn't allowed indoors hardly anywhere in the united states that you have often outside of clubs and bars and restaurants a group of a cluster of people smoking tobacco and the police will come in and just say well we smell marijuana and literally have 10 15 people up against the wall and ask them to produce what's inside their pockets and if they were reaching and pull out a baggie they got busted for it, even though there was no co probable cause that would have led them to that criminal. But, what, but why did they empty their pockets? Why don't they just not empty their pockets? Well, um, because two reasons. Um, one's kind of an obvious one for anybody who's ever been nose to nose with NYPD. If they're asking you to do something, you do it. <laughs> I don't. I don't do it. They 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 asked me to empty my pockets. I didn't do it. I made them search my pockets. They've well, stopped me. What, yeah. What's great. At, well, in this respect, um, you would be held out as a wonderful aberration of somebody who asserted their Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights. Because if most Americans and New Yorkers even knew what these rights were, and they asserted them, this would definitely check this illegal behavior by police that has uh, created this incredible marijuana law enforcement policy up there. Well, it's so uh, a lot of a lot of leveraging of people this week. I mean, of course, we had the the, the, the soda ban on cups, etc., coming along. So <laughs> there's a lot of touch points that have um, touched people this week. And I guess um, you know, Lorraine had our commentator who's not here tonight. She had suggested using uh, sniffing dogs rather than stop and frisk. And um, you know, but I guess that would smooth out the um, the, the the profiling a little bit, uh, so maybe it wouldn't have been so effective. But what, what, where next on the journey for for normal? Because although it's a small step, you know, like I just pointed out, it was already there to begin with. You know, in a way, we just didn't assert ourselves. Uh, that's our fault. You know, so they made a big deal out of nothing and gave us something we already had and made it seem like we moved forward, right? That's correct. It's an excellent assessment. So what is next then? Well, what's next is the big enchilada and the given. Marijuana should be legal and taxed and regulated like alcohol and tobacco, and for that matter, you know, caffeine-like products. And that is where this is going. And here are the numbers. 75% of Americans support medical access to cannabis. 73% support this notion we've been talking about tonight, decriminalization. And finally, 50% of Americans, according to the Gallup polls, uh, want marijuana legalized now. And so we only suffered through 12 years of alcohol prohibition in this country. We're just about to come into our 75th year of marijuana prohibition. And so if government actually wants to achieve its stated goals, like children not having access to it, people not using it and driving, people being responsible with it, um, that there's a paradigm between use versus abuse, They'll never achieve that without a taxation and regulation scheme. And so this year alone, the states of Colorado and Washington, their citizens will vote on legalization measures. And at some point, it is a fait accompli. One of our states may be a huge one like California, which only by three percentage points did not pass a legalization ballot initiative two years ago. Um, it's going to happen, and therefore there's going to be this terrific pressure that's going to start on the federal government to change the prohibition laws. 
Okay, well, we uh, start with small steps, whether they're real or not real, and um, I guess this is uh, part of our journey. Um, do you expect a big change in stop and frisk as a result of this? Frankly, no, and I'm glad you just would ask a pointed question in regarding that because I think one of the quid pro quos that were traded off in this exchange is Mr. Kelly and NYPD didn't leave these negotiations without that ability that they strongly want to preserve, whether it has to do with for their own protection, as they would say, or for looking for terrorists, etc. cetera, that um, stop and frisk, that can probably still happen. But the reason the force of the impetus is now, according to Mr. Cuomo and Mr. Bloomberg, is going to be removed. And okay. for normal and cannabis consumers in New York, that is a very good first step towards some more practical reforms. Great.